And there we go. I'm officially recording now. Okay. I'll edit later. But all right. So a few of you certainly already know Paul. And a few of you don't. You've only heard about Paul. And most of it was true, and some of it I embellished just a little bit. <laughs> you know, feel free to keep keep that fiction going too. Okay, well, you're not sure what it is yet, though, are you? There <laughs> is Richard. I'm going to mute everybody that isn't Paul, just for the sake of a really good signal. All right, so it's not. Don't be offended by my muting you. And there'll be a question and answer. There's Aaron. Hello, Aaron. And I, there's Richard, Aaron, okay, all right, and Gary and Sophie, and Amita, Amita's here. Okay, we've got a few folks. I'm glad I didn't start yet. It's starting to get crowded in here. Nicoletta's getting out of her car. <laughs> and Marlene's here. She's the bottom of my screen. Who else? All right, I don't think I've left anybody out now. Yeah, I'm glad I waited a second or two. But oh, hello, hello, Amy. Strangely enough, I cannot seem to do anything with Amy's screen or Margaret's screen. Hello, Margaret. I assume you guys are muted. Oh, I am hearing Amy's actually isn't, but it is now. Okay. All right. So I've known Paul now for what? 17 years yeah yeah god help us yeah i know it's amazing and look how well preserved we are <laughs> it's i like a nice cup of formaldehyde every day yeah. <laughs> it saves the embalmer on the day of <laughs> it does. Um, and saves, saves so much on cologne it's great on it's, what cologne <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> that's right the sweet smell of, of formaldehyde. All right, acupuncture school. Oh, I do remember that in 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 uh, human anatomy physiology yeah. lab. Yeah, it was lots of lots of fun. All right, so Paul, would you please inform everybody here that hasn't heard about your life? And I'm going to basically back to chapter. I'm going into chapter one. <laughs> oh, my, oh my God, you read it. Okay. Of your book. And right. so let's start at the beginning of your journey down this path of Chinese medicine and just all that you are at this point. Okay. So um, when I was 13 years old, I had uh, pneumonia. I went to the hospital, got a chest x ray, and a passing orthopedic surgeon was walking by. And he said, oh, he's got whatever it was that they called it, uh, which basically was a, uh, a series of deposits inside the bone that, in general, don't mean anything. It's just sort of this genetic anomaly. Um, and in very rare cases, um, can be a real problem. So um, I was treated for the pneumonia, and then they thought it would be a good idea to have me get a scan. Uh, which I did, and and I was one of those lucky few who, uh, for whom it is a, a real problem. Um, so, um, they found that it initially, whatever the deposits were, it had basically destroyed the upper part of my right arm, the humerus. Was there was a whole space between the top and the mid part of the humerus that was, at this point, jelly. He said, well, if you were to take a fall or take a hit, um, it would probably just shatter um, or, in a, in a sense, squish. Uh, so they scheduled surgery uh, and took bone from the right side of my, uh, sorry, the left side of my hip and filled it in um, and said, well, we're going to need to keep an eye on you uh, while you still continue to grow because this condition is usually only active all the body grows. So every three months, I guess, for the next six years, uh, I had regular scans. Along that time, MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging, came into being. Uh, I started using that. And I was going in for what was supposed to be my last scan. And uh, thinking, probably not a big deal. And how old were uh, you? I was 19 and very active the time. In fact, I was uh, 
competing in martial arts at the time and um, felt great. And uh, they went in, uh, took a scan, expected it to be fine. Uh, and then when they took a look at my pelvis, the right side of the pelvis, especially around the, the iliac crest area, it was completely destroyed. Um, and everybody's like, how come you don't have pain? I have no idea. Um, and they said, well, that, there's a tumor in there about the size of a softball. So um, we scheduled surgery again to remove that, um, more bone grafts, uh, reconstructive work. Um, and then they needed a biopsy because the change was so abrupt. And uh, the biopsy came back malignant. So um, now we're sort of in a space where we don't know what to do because um, it's such a rare condition. There's really no effective treatment for it. So there was, you know, there was some chemistry involved, steroids, that sort of thing. And while I was in the hospital, uh, there was, you know, with with that type of reconstruction, there's uh, there's a lot of morphine involved. It was kind of a painful experience. So um, I was waiting for the morphine, um, really kind of really waiting for the morphine. That was a lot of the time. And um, I was just trying to close my eyes and try to relax because I had 20 minutes to go. And um, I got into this state that was sort of like half asleep, half awake, and saw what looked like looked to me to be like the image of a mosaic and um i remember particularly there being this one section of the the mosaic was this very bright sky blue and then it was almost like the way uh, the camera comes down in a hitchcock film it kind of came down zero closer and closer onto one tile and when it got to that tile I wouldn't say I heard it, but it was more like I felt it like this tile is you. And then two fingers came up and plucked the tile out. And a whole section of the mosaic came down. And then the tile was put back and all the, the other tiles came back and said, this is why you won't die. And right at that moment, I felt this huge wave pass through my body, which I now understand was chi, but uh, had no idea what it was. All I knew was that I felt great. It was the strangest thing. I, I woke up kind of abruptly. I didn't have pain. Um, and the strangest thing was, even though the room was exactly the same, everything looked different. Mm -hmm. As if it were more vibrant somehow. Right. Um, and then as people would come in and out of the room, they they pass. I had a sense of what they were feeling towards me, or at least I thought I did, you know, how do I know, right? <laughs> but um, I, I, I became acutely aware of the feelings of others at that time. And um, so they came in and offered me morphine, which I turned down. I said, no, I, I didn't want to dull. I felt so good, I didn't want to dull anything. And, you know, the nurse probably thought, you know, somebody struck me in the head or something because I, <laughs> I was really um, pleading for it about 20 minutes early. And, um, but I was, I was fine. And then later that day, they, they were like, okay, well, you know, today's the day we're gonna unhook you from all these traction devices and see if we can get you standing. And, um, so we're gonna need to give you a lot of pain medication, and, which I also didn't feel like I needed. Uh, so, uh, they got me, I was walking around and um, also and, and continued to feel a lot more uh, aware of everybody that I came into contact with. You know, I was practicing up in Alma Hospital trying to learn how to walk because they said, well, when you can get around by yourself, you can leave. Uh, hmm. So I was like, uh, so, um, and that sort of continued for about three days, I would say. And during that three days, um, it slowly started to ebb away. And as it ebbed away, the pain returned. And so did my massive amounts of anxiety and my worries about not living. Um, you know, I got sent home from the hospital and everything crashed. Uh, my 
blood pressure went way up. I found it really difficult to keep food down. Um, I couldn't sleep. Uh, I don't know. I just, I really, I could feel myself declining rapidly. And I couldn't understand. And I was still trying to figure out what happened during that time. Uh, so, you know, I did what, what every nerd like me would do. I, I went to the library, right, and tried to read every book I could on mystical experiences. None of them were like mine. They were way more interesting. Um, and, and they lasted longer, and, and people could do stuff, you know. None of those were me. Um, and so I was, I was, but I was acutely aware that my body was breaking down fast. And I had the sense that I wasn't really going to be around much longer. And um, I was on a train platform. And I looked across the street and I see this sign for Leah Tam Acupuncture, just outside of Boston at the time, a Wollaston train station. I look across and I get that same wave pass through my body. Um, and I was like, what just happened? You know, and I continue to, to look at this sign and uh, train came and went. Uh, I limped my way over there and I, you know, and here is this, you know, guy sort of new to, to the United States from China sitting behind his desk. And I just start spilling it. I mean, this happened to me, that happened to me. And then, you know, and of course, you know, he's new to this country. So he's understanding probably every fifth word that I say. And, um, but at the end, I finally said, do you think you can help me? I said, yeah, you know, simple, right? I said, really? And he said, yeah. He's like, in fact, if you don't feel better, don't pay me. Which, you know, the joke's kind of on him because I didn't have any money. <laughs> I, I had like two subway tokens and a library card, you know. And so I told him that, and he said, um, he said, it's okay. He said, kind of squinted a little. He says, men like you come back. I was like, okay, that's a little odd, but okay. So he gets me on the table, puts a whole lot of needles in, and then begins to move his hands over me. And I feel this, in, that wave again, this intense current moving through my body. Only now it seems more direct. And it's hitting those places that feel both painful and weak. And I can feel, feel it fill the weak spaces and dissipate the pain as if somebody pulled a cork. It was, I could feel it drain out my body as this is moving. And then I fell asleep. About 25 minutes later, because I checked the clock, I felt like I'd been asleep a long time. He takes the needles out, stands me up, and for about 10 or 15 seconds, I feel normal. And then I can feel my, the weight of my body kind of come down onto the injuries again. And he just looked at me, and he said, it lasts longer. He said, the chi is there. The body hasn't caught up. And uh, so I uh, went to the library. <laughs> Took out the only book I could find on acupuncture, read it several times, and then came back to his office and proceeded to tell him what he does for a living. <laughs> you know, my usual humility. And um, he, was, he was kind of amused, you know, and he said, oh, he said, uh, some of that's true, some of that's not true. And he started to explain what it was. And I said, well, what'd you do with your hands? And he said, oh, I was moving chi, you know, from me to you. And I just became the world's biggest pest. I, I look back on it and I'm like, how, how he could stand me, I'll never know. Um, but I continued to ask lots and lots of questions. And finally, he wrote his address down. And he said, I'll see you Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, be on time. Uh, not realizing that I'd just been adopted. And, uh, so I was early. Uh, maybe one was in my life. And, we, and, and he started to teach me. And um, believe it or not, this is the short version of the story. Uh, I then um, learned from him. You know, I went back to school, changed everything. My whole life changed. I, I decided at that point that uh, I became acutely aware that life can be short. And so not to spend too much time in things I hate. And I hated being a, a finance major. So I switched to literature. Much and my father was thrilled, of course. Oh yes, yes. Because yeah. um, you know there are so many, there are so many ads in the newspaper. Everybody asks the poets. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, 
would study with him whenever I could, you know, um, on the weekends or, you know, on school breaks over the summer. Um, to, you know, I get out of school, like the only job I could get is the funny part was in finance. <laughs> and, and I, I would go back at night, you know, and train with him then. And then best thing that ever happened, I got laid off, uh, which is kind of like getting paroled. And then trying to explain to him the concept of severance pay to somebody who's from China is hysterical because it's like, well, if they have money, why don't they just pay you and have you work? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, um, so we went, uh, he said, let's go to China. And we went, you know, I mean, it's, it took a little doing. We had to get visas and stuff. And then we, we went to China and um, I got to study from his teacher uh, we had a chance to get over, you know, to like, to, to Shaolin Temple, to learn, you know, from a bunch of people who he knew. And um, while we were in China, he, um, he asked me what I was going to do when I got back. And uh, I said, like, I don't know. And I don't care. You know, I'm, I'm, I was young, you know, I was what, uh, 23. Oh, yeah. Um, didn't really care. You know, I didn't have any responsibilities. And, um, he said, uh, you know, he's like, in China, we say only an idiot looks for a donkey. He's already riding. <laughs> and I, I figured I knew what he was saying, but I was like, yeah, so what would we say in America? You know? and, and, Without profanity. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and he, said, um, he said, why don't you come and work with me? And so he, I, he had already taught me like uh, tween out Chinese massage and energy work and I didn't think anybody would ever want to come and see me. Um, I figured like when they can see him, but it, uh, people did want to see me. So um, I figured, you know, maybe this isn't a bad gig. And um, I wound up going to acupuncture school. And from there, I tried to find any, any and all the best Qigong masters I could find. Uh, so we went back to China a few times, uh, to Taiwan, Hong Kong. Macau, most of the Chinatowns in North America, and most of what I got was shameless self-promotion. A, a few people were, were decent, but most people were, you know, they, they'd caught on. You know, if you market really well, maybe you don't have to be that good. And um, a, through a series of very strange circumstances, I uh, wound up meeting Master O in one way. And um, the... It was one of those situations where I realized I was trained well enough to know that I wasn't trained well. Um, I knew there was more. And uh, when I met his students, they had been practicing for about two years. We shook hands and I could feel they had more ability in two years than I had after 13 years. Okay, so either sneak out the back and pretend this never happened or start again. And I was really happy that I started again because I, I have yet to find anything better. Um, and, I, and I remember in my more flippant moment, moments, um, <laughs> I had, uh, uh, you, you know, at that point I was mastered out. You know, I had yeah. met so many different so-called masters that I was like, I'm so done with that. So I said to him, you know, if I, you, you get that if I find somebody better than you, I'm throwing you over, right? And um, uh, then I remember this woman not wanting to translate that. And uh, <laughs> like, no, it's really Celia. Just you know, and he laughed. You know, he wasn't even angry or or he, not even like sagacious about the whole thing. He that was funny. <laughs> and he said, um, "Well, you would have to, because you don't work for me, and you don't even work for yourself. You work for the people who come to you for help. It would be your obligation." Hmm. And I was like, I think, I think I found my guy. Yeah. So, uh, and I have yet to find anybody better than you. I really, I'm so glad you said that because, you know, when I speak to people about how great Pong Gong is and Master O is, of course, and they're like, well, what else have you studied? You know, and I'm like, well, I, to be honest, it's where I started. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, Paul showed me and, and he's like, this is the way you do this. And I'm like, okay, well, you're, you got the skills down, man. I'm listening to you. And so I, I want to always tell people, you need to talk to Paul Frazier about this. He's the one who's been shopping around a lot and has points of comparison. 
for me, I just, I hear somebody brought up or I see somebody, oh, this, you've got to go check this person out. And then I'll, I'll check them out. And I'm like, no, it's just, you know, maybe I'm biased, but it's just not there. No. It's up, up to that point. I had learned like learned and learned well, uh, about 32 styles of Qigong. That's a few. Yeah. <laughs> and, and had been exposed well over a hundred, you know, I tried well over a hundred, but really learned about 32 of them. And, you know, it, 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 Qigong is kind of an interesting thing. It's, it's kind of like saying exercise, right? You know, like you could be an Olympic swimmer or an Olympic gymnast, right? And they both are excellently conditioned athletes, but mm -hmm. you can't eat each other's sports, you know, um, where, and what I found with, with Pangu Shengong is that it, it tends to calibrate itself to your needs. And that is really unusual. I've heard many people say, oh, you know, energy is energy. I'm like, not mm. really. Any, any, like saying music is music. You know, <laughs> if, if I listen to heavy metal or I listen to classical, I'm going to feel a little different. Um, they're going to put me in different states of mind or being. And, um, so you can't really say that, you know, if one practices a martial style of Qigong, the healing applications are very limited. I'm not saying they don't exist, but they're very limited. Um, if one practices a healing style of Qigong, you know, don't go out and fight crime anytime soon. <laughs> you know, just different ways of, of doing that. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I saw uh, some video about two bodybuilders who were taken out there to do some type of you know, uh, military, run through their military training just without any pre-training. Like, you guys are bodybuilders, now do this. And of course, yeah. they failed miserably because sure. they weren't conditioned for that. Any more than if you took those guys into the gym and said, do this, they might yeah. not operate as well. It's, it is specific to the training and what you're trying to accomplish. And, and, but you've done both, though. I mean, to be fair, you've studied martial cultivation of energy as yeah. well as for health. So you've got a mm -hmm. point of comparison. Yeah, yeah, and they and it it is interesting. Um, they there are benefits, some benefits to studying both. At least they have been for me. Um, and at the same time, um, if if anybody, you know, for those of you listening at home, right, <laughs> uh, anybody is, is at all wanting to embark uh, in, in a healing profession, or if you would like to help yourself. Um, I feel 100% confident in recommending that system of Qigong over anything else that I know. Um, it, it, you, you really, in my opinion, starting at the absolute top. So, yeah. So, let's, um, we'll, we'll get into that in just a second. I'm just looking at what I was going to ask you as far as questions. I've heard you say a few times that doing Tai Chi had very, 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 very important things uh, to impart to you in your life and how you were able to operate and how you wouldn't even be around if it wasn't for Tai Chi, you thought. I, Maybe I'm overstating that. <laughs> no, no, for, for, be, because of when I learned what. Mm -hmm. um, if, I think if I had come to Pangu Shengong sooner, I, 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 it would have been good, but I had learned these other styles of, of Qigong and a couple of things. There are so many benefits to Tai Chi. It, it is basically an embodied philosophy. So, and you know, I promise I won't go into too much of it because if I do, you'll number one, I'll never stop. And number two, I probably won't make sense. Uh, <laughs> but is if anybody has ever come across the I Ching or the book of changes, um, that book is considered by many to be one of the oldest books in the world. And it contains um, archetypal situations. Basically, they say, okay, they're symbolized by trigrams, which are three lines, either solid or broken, put into combinations, and when there are they're, they're eight of them, and when they are combined, you get 64 hexagrams. And out of those permutations, you get 4,098 possible scenarios. And they basically say, look, these, this is all you can have. No matter what's going on in life, it can only be one of these scenarios. 
and out of that, many things were developed. So Tai Chi was developed out of that system, out of that understanding. That we, if we harmonize with energy and we understand which of the, the eight primary energies we're getting and how they can be combined, those energies then combine inside a body and produce very tangible results. Um, now, some of those results, from a health standpoint, it sinks the chi, so it draws the, the life force in the body and it sinks it below, first below the diaphragm and then later below the body, which is kind of like if you've ever had a wood-burning stove um, and you have a damper, you know, if you open mm -hmm. the damper, you get a, a raging fire, but you also burn the fuel out really quickly. Whereas if you turn it down, you get just enough heat and you can preserve it a lot longer. So there's that. The effect of pulling chi down also lowers blood pressure. The effect of making your legs hurt um, is a way of making you overcome the primal part of the brain. So, you know, when a person is, you, you know, your, your amygdala says, get up, that hurts. You know, and then the, the cerebral cortex says, no, maybe stay in that a little bit longer. And, and what it is is using the rational mind to overcome the survival instinct. Um, so that they become appropriate uh, over time. In that respect, I would say it probably saved my life. Uh, I had uh, difficulty controlling my survival instincts at times. And so for, for me, that was really useful. It also has the added benefit of condensing energy inside the joint spaces. So many people who have arthritis, it's really beneficial for that. It's not quite as beneficial for somebody who, say, had uh, a life-threatening disease, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a great way of circulating and accumulating chi and staying healthy. And when Master O and Vincent Chu, who you can say who that is if you'd like, um, combined mm -hmm. those two worlds together, you have a different creation, a different animal. A, a Pangu Tai Chi, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So Vincent, um, there may not be many people in this world who are as good as him in terms of Tai Chi. And I know I'm not overstating that. Um, I, I've seen some very, very famous people and um, I know Vincent leaves them well behind. Uh, he is extraordinary. Um, he's also an excellent teacher and incredibly insightful. Um, while he was uh, practicing, this is the story that I'm giving the Reader's Digest version of the story he told me. He was practicing Tai Chi and Mastro watched him do it. And they got into this discussion about how at one time Tai Chi used to channel divine energy. And now because of the many changes and the way people have, have um, altered it, and, um, taught it differently or missed some of the nuances, it, it doesn't quite do that anymore. So Vincent was like, well, what if uh, <laughs> we, could, we could combine those two? And um, they did. Uh, I mean, I'm uh, really summarizing here. You know, he and, and Vincent got together and really worked on the movements. And Mastro would, uh, as I understand it, say, okay, maybe the movement should be a little bit different here, should be a little bit different there. And then because of Mastro's power, his strength, he was also mm -hmm. able to use more of that connection into the movements. Um, a few years later, um, my wife, Anisha Desai Frazier, um, who is um, a truly gifted yoga instructor, was wondering if that could happen with yoga. Mm -hmm. um, and so she wrote to Master O. Um, they had a, an exchange, and I'm, I'm really summarizing here. And he said, Yes, you know, we, could, we could do that. And so um, she flew out and they, they uh, created a Pangu yoga routine with the same intent to, mm -hmm. to channel that divine energy in, in what had been uh, an ancient practice and probably at one time did move it. But um, again, I'm, I'm guessing that if one were to, to go to Lululemon, their intent wasn't to channel divine energy. You know? um, it's become quite commercial. The same can be said about <laughs> Uh, tai Chi, you know, there are, there are studios opening up everywhere. I um, mean, you always see the big yin and yang symbol and, and so forth, but, but not, it's, it's, a lot of it's on the surface. 
And there are some really gifted teachers out there and they're like everything else, the shameless self promoter. <laughs> So when it comes to this idea of cultivating energy and storing energy yeah. and you get out of the outside of the world of Qigong, Tai Chi, um, yeah. it's not really understood, is it? It's not a common concept of, oh, of cultiv cultivating. You, yeah. you have new styles popping up all the time of different treatment techniques, modalities with the name quantum and, you know, energy in it. Right. And, and, but there's really no concept of cultivation. So what's it, what's the advantage of having cultivation as opposed to an energy style where there is no cultivation? Okay. In, in my not so humble opinion, um, I would say, so a lot of those things, they stress this concept of ye, right? Intent. Yeah. Of course that's big today, right? Everybody's talking about, I, I intend, I intend, um, without really understanding what that means. Now, there are certain things. I, I remember uh, someone saying, um, oh, we live in a consensual reality. I don't think so. There are a lot of things in this reality I don't consent to. Um, and yet, here it is. Um, and I can tell you, even if I strongly disagree with gravity, and I pitch myself off an, an, an eight-story balcony, pretty sure gravity's gonna win out over that one. So there are things with which one must harmonize. That's just nature. And of course, the Taoists were really the first people to, to systematize energy cultivation. They understood that. Hmm. Now, one can direct or move energy through intent. That's absolutely true. Um, however, it's not likely to, an effect, to affect a lasting change without enough of a battery behind it. So the stronger the chi, there's, the, there's an axiom in, in, in Qigong understanding that very loosely translated, it says, attention energizes and intention organizes. Which means, yes, if I bring my attention, my energy must follow. If I create movements or breathing patterns or intentions that harmonize with the greater flow of universal energy, I'm likely to have that flow through me and it's going to accumulate and strengthen what happens on the inside. From there, if I want to organize that energy, let's say to help somebody else, to direct it through intent, then I've got something to work with. Not only do I have what's inside the body, but that's a relationship that one now has with, with the universe. And like all relationships, it takes time to build. And it takes adjustment and understanding over time. And so this is where the word gong in, in Qigong comes from. Gong means loosely translated movement, action, work, or cultivation. Inherent in that word is over a long period of time and with complete attention or devotion. So in this way, a person is doing this. One has the relationship with this universal flow. It also is accumulated in the body. And so they, there's, a, there's a sort of a mutual resonance, which just intending is not. It's almost like I, I think of it in this way that somebody may, um, if I don't have that relationship and I'm barking orders to the universe, hey, go do this, heal this <laughs> guy, you know, or go do this, make me rich, or whatever, whatever it is that people are doing with intention today. Um, but there isn't this intention. Well, how far would any of us get? Um, I think that, that this, this aspect of spending time and care uh, with, with an appropriate amount of, of humility that, that, that it takes to do that, um, to be willing to learn from the universal energy, not just command it. Mm -hmm. Energy comes from a divine source. Um, and it's, it's, it's useful for us to listen. I remember, you know, my, my first teacher used to say, everybody talks to God, but nobody listens. <laughs> and and, and that, his, his feeling was in cultivation, one can listen. No, that's, that's a great answer because you know, there's so much. It's a sea of ever-growing modalities and, and a lot of this narrative of, like you said, if I have the intention, then it's going to flow this way. It's going to go my way. And the idea of, of actually 
having discipline and like you said, humility to then go, I am, I am, I feel so small compared to the infinite nature of all that is, who am I to bark orders? And, and it is a relationship. And it seems that the attention span, at least in the West, is a bit short and we want it all now. I want to take three easy courses and get my title of master to put over my, you know, my door and then start charging money for treatments. Yeah. Um, you know, and, it, and let's say it is, let's say somebody gives you an excellent tool in, in, in three easy lessons. Even still, um, I tend to be very wary of the title master. Let's, let's use a, a, an example, right? I think we all can agree that the ocean on the earth is vast, right? Yes. I can't command that. <laughs> the entire universe of energy makes that ocean look tiny. So how could I command that? And, and in what way can I say, oh, I have mastered that? Uh, I haven't. So I, I, you know, I tend to, for, for one's own protection, I would say be wary of, of that term, like either giving, giving oneself that title or, or accepting it from someone else. Uh, you know, cause I, you know, if I may just drown. If I <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Yeah, it's, <sighs> Yeah, I try not to be too frustrated by it. But I, I think the relationship part is missing as well. And, and really, as humans, how well do we do relationships? Mm. And, and when you get into Pongu Shingong, what, what was one of the major messages that Mastro received while he was in prison and then afterwards? I mean, what was the whole password phrase? for? And if you would, would you please go into a second for the password phrase, sure. what that means and how that pertains to relationships? Well, I, I would, I'll do my best. Okay. Um, this, and this is only through my own filter. Um, so the, 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 the opening statement that one says three times before practicing the form, take kindness and benevolence as basis, take frankness and friendliness to heart. Um, there are a number of ways that that could have been translated. Um, my, my understanding and my interpretation from um, asking interminable questions and <laughs> hopefully listening well enough um, is that creation was a loving act. If we want to harmonize with the intent of our creator, we want to bring up that universal love. Now that means through in, when one expresses that in a human way is through kindness and and that and, and it comes down to a lot of things it just basically says you know we we want to be a benefit wherever we can and and benevolence is this this idea that you know one says one gives without expecting anything back that's a tough one um but it is in the act of giving kindness and benevolence that that flow it moves through us as it moves through us it accumulates in us we get filled as we give it um, and therefore we are harmonizing with the intent of the creator now mastro says one only has to look at nature to see that you know the sun doesn't say i'm going to shine on you but maybe not on you i'm going to i'm going to rain you know i'm going to give water to to everybody but you um, or everybody gets to breathe except that person I didn't like. You know, there's, there's, that doesn't happen. You know, the, it's basically open to everyone, regardless of whether we deserve it or not. <coughs> you know, I've, I've thought about this a lot. Um, when you think about how our planet is and how we mistreat it, how it still does its best to, to support us and keep us alive. Um, that's a big deal. And so um, in, in that sense, that's sort of how I see kindness and benevolence to sort of say, well, let's, let's emulate that as a, as a behavior. Frankness and friendliness, uh, in, in Chinese cosmology, one's consciousness lives in the heart. 
And so we say the truest expression of that heart is a sincere and a friendly heart. And so that's, that was my understanding was take frankness and friendliness to heart. I'm sure there is so much more to it, but that's, that's what I've got. <laughs> and that was good. It was very good. Yeah, I think the password phrase is something you could explore forever and, and always find new layers of meaning and understanding from it. And, and the application, I mean, there's so many times during the day, the week, <laughs> that I hear in my head, but what would Master O do? Which is a different bracelet, you know. Um, and, and it does, it echoes in my head over and over again, but what, how would Master O handle this? I really want to go off on this person. I really want to take them out right now, at least verbally. And then I'm like, but would Master O do that? <laughs> no, he wouldn't. <laughs> he would probably do this. And, and it does alter my behavior in the moment. It, it makes logical sense um, when, when I'm reasonable, right? When I'm rational. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it basically says, you know, one, one does not cure violence with violence. You can stop violence with violence, but you don't cure it. You know, it, it, it will continue. But one, if, if one can persuade somebody not to be violent, if someone can persuade someone to behave better, the only way that can be done ultimately is through demonstrating it and through giving it. They have to receive it in order to, to use it. Um, yeah, this is one of the things that I, I was saying, you know, we were sort of talking about the, the sort of current pop psychology and I've heard people say, you know, anger is a choice. Um, and, and I would argue that it's not in some cases. If one has been exposed, let's say, to anger for a very long time, one absorbs that. If I have felt angry for a very long time, I have cultivated it by default. So if that vibration is in my body and in my consciousness so powerfully, and I don't have something to choose that's better than that, mm -hmm. and it has to be relatively strong in me, then it may not be a choice at that point. And that's hard to accept, especially, you know, if, if we happen to be on the receiving end of that, right? Right. That's unjust. I don't deserve that. I don't, you know, in any of my little crybaby, crybaby things in the moment. <laughs> and you say, yeah, but... Um, if it were given, if it were offered, if that person had received it before they, they encountered us, they would behave differently. Now we have this opportunity to give it. Now, and this is the interesting part. According to Master O, in the giving of it, it has to pass through us. Basically, whatever we give is passing through us. And that means it's going to accumulate in us as we give it. So that means if I'm giving evil, I'm accumulating that. But if I'm giving good, I'm also accumulating that. And that also enables me, makes me stronger in a way to give it even more and to affect a more positive change. Um, easy to say, right? right. Um, uh, not, maybe not to do, but um, that, that's what we've got. <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, I wanted to move, um, I want to talk about your book. I mean, that's one of the major reasons we have you on here. And we, and we have been talking about your book because yeah. this subject matter is obviously in your book titled Qigong, Rediscovering Humanity. I did that yes. title correct, didn't I? <laughs> uh, our, our humanity, it, it almost was Rediscovering Humanity. Oh, and what is it? Our humanity. It's rediscovering Our Humanity. Our, okay. You know, I, I don't know. Your sounds pretty good too. You know, I, I, I left out a word and I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's other sections in your in your book that talk about the history so i'd like for the next three hours for you to go ahead and talk about the history of qigong <laughs> <laughs> which um, i know you could do <laughs> sadly um the only one who would be interested in is me uh, but yeah but. i'd stick around for the three hours i would <laughs> um but you no, know, I, I i know that you can't sit here and talk for the next three hours about the history of but it is in there and what i found was and I wasn't surprised as I'm reading through there that you do a really good job of covering the the main points of the history of it, which is I think hardly anybody knows. Mm -hmm. Truly, I mean, I don't think very many people who even do qigong have studied the history, certainly not in the way that you have. 
And I think you do a really good job of touching on all those, those high points. It, are there any main pieces of the history that you think, so you're, you're talking to, let me move over here to another view so I can see we have here right now because I've left this whole group view. You've got a lot of people here who have been doing Qigong, some for quite a while, and some who are brand new. And, and so in the history, this rich history of Qigong, what are the high points that you would like to throw out there to let them know that you think would help to um, enlighten them on the beauty, the deep beauty of the history of Qigong? I, I would say... Um, there is no part of ancient Chinese culture that is not informed in some way by energy cultivation. So if one looks at the construction, for example, the pagoda style, you know, that's, that's proper feng shui. It's to maximize the flow of energy through the structure. The way buildings are, are, are arranged, it's to make sure that there's positive energy in that space. If, you know, uh, music at the time, you know, there are such a, th such a thing as the six healing sounds. At the time, music was a form of cultivation and a way of healing people. Confucius said the first, the, the, the primary purpose of music is to bring happiness. Hmm. And so the idea that um, if one was cultivated and could hit these tones, mm -hmm. six healing tones, it would, it would, strengthen the organs of the listeners. The same was true for poetry. When a, when a person looks at uh, calligraphy, for example, uh, calligraphy, most of the calligraphers were in some ways masters of energy cultivation. The idea was to be able to express one's spirit through the brushwork and, and a very deliberate action of exhaling the chi through the brush into the ink. Wow. And so that when one looks at uh, the calligraphy, it's like, more than just artwork. Yeah. yeah. Like behind you it's, right now. People can see that on right. their screen right now. There's a beautiful oh, calligraphy by Mastro right there. Um, it, the idea, uh, people use these calligraphies as feng shui cures or as mm. charms, uh, protective charms. And I know a lot of people say, oh, that's superstition. It might be today if people try to do it. it but if, if somebody was truly cultivated, mm -hmm. It's a real experience. You can really feel it when you stand in front of it, especially Master Um the, the martial arts, it's, it's, it's apparent. There's, there's no system of Chinese martial arts that in some way doesn't have a, a qi component to it. Um, uh, many people don't understand that now. A lot of the movements look a little bit, you say, oh, wow, not a lot of power to that movement. You can bet that the person who has either learned it or who they learned from didn't understand that aspect. Um, the um, let's see what else uh, military philosophy uh, or, or or application. Um, there were entire people who could read the terrain, the energy of the terrain. Um, so there was really no there's really no aspect of Chinese ancient Chinese culture that doesn't that isn't informed by this idea of trying to bring the most life promoting energy to it. I think um, if that had been allowed to continue in China, if um, and, and throughout their history, there were multiple times people tried to suppress it. And the beauty of Qigong is also the thing why certain people in power may not want you to have it. Uh -huh. When you are strong energetically, you're really hard to influence, right? So if this, if my cent central core, my Chong vessel is full of qi, now I don't have a space for something that's not harmonious to enter. So if I'm not feeling empty inside and I turn on the television and somebody says, you know why you're miserable? Cause you don't have this car. <laughs> and if I'm empty, I'm going to like, I bet I am miserable cause I don't have that car. Right. And, and so we get, we're able to be fooled in this way. We, we replace something very important with something not very important. What is important, right, is happiness and contentment. What is not important is satisfaction, which is happiness is cheap substitute. And the way you know it is happiness is hard to achieve. Contentment is hard to achieve. Satisfaction is easy, right? I just need a chocolate bar. <laughs> but it, 
sticks around. That happiness sticks around about as long as the dopamine rush from the chocolate. Sometimes that chocolate can stick around too, though, Paul. I, you know, you try to put the <laughs> pants on, you're like, whoa. Right, exactly right. <laughs> but like, will I be satisfied? <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> right. And so, um, you know, in, in the same way, it's easy to, to fool people. If, if their chi is weak, right? So let's say you have what, it, it, there's a term for it that is loosely translated as righteous chi, mm-hmm. which if I ever get into a hip hop career, that's going to be my <laughs> thing. The, the idea of, of righteous right? It, it's in a center column of the body, right? And so it, that chi, when it accumulates, uh, it, it informs one of what will promote life and what will detract from it. So if that is solid and strong, and I encounter, say, uh, a calligraphy, and I stand in front of it, and I feel that expansiveness, Mm -hmm. that's promoting my life. If I get that advertisement that says, you know what you need? You need this new product, right? I'm going to feel that contract. I'm going to feel that, no, you don't need. You know, it's the righteous. Now, uh, that works really great in terms of choosing a leader. You know, it, it's almost it, when it's highly developed and a person is, is cultivated for a long time and is able to stay in a calm and, and relaxed and receptive state. When deceptive energy is thrown your way, it's hard to miss. You're like, oh, you know, you become the human lie detector. I mean, mm. you it's probably going off on every political debate, right? I mean, pick anyone, right? Because there is something there. You feel that. Now, how can a person manipulate the masses if everybody has righteous chi? So, of course, that you know, throughout Chinese history, there, there have been periods where people say, well, we need to outlaw this. Um, and and it, it, it is happening even today in China. There are only some systems that are allowed, um, right. probably the that aren't so good. Exactly. Yeah. Now that makes sense. And I hope that, that hope the people watching right now and those who watch the recording of this get that of how important this is with the cultivation, really good cultivation techniques of energy. And, and not just for the sake of filling yourself up with just power, but that I tell people when you do Pongu Gong, what's interesting about it, I've watched it in some of my students that some of them have, you know, self-admittedly been not the nicest people and have done some pretty heinous things and prone to do more heinous things. And yet when they do the form, they find themselves changing Mm. over time, sometimes painfully, but changing nonetheless. And I'm like, it'll do that. There's this beautiful intelligence that seems to work in the deepest place to give your own personal agonizing (laughs) tempering process and but I think it's fantastic to um, to really get that point across of how deeply transformative this is and how it changes like you said it fills you up to where things that might have once once given you um, uh, sway or pull no longer seem to have that kind of pull over you your vices that you wish were no longer in your life that you could rid them once and for all you find that they're easier to resist after you do this for a while. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's true. And I, uh, recently somebody was saying, oh, so, you know, it, it was probably easy for you. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I said, you know, I don't, I don't think this happened. This, this worked because of me. I think it worked in spite of you. Yeah. Um, I think that um, it, it certainly works faster and better if I'm willing to try, right? If I'm willing to harmonize with that, that message of kindness, let's say. If I'm, if I'm willing to really examine and say, well, well am, I, what, am I motivated by, let's say, greed in this moment? A- a- am, I being, am I being lazy? Am I being selfish? Um, or am I actually trying to benefit the people around me and in due course benefit myself? Um, you know, it, that makes the cultivation work a whole lot faster and better. You know, am I treating people the way I would like to be treated? You know, when we can achieve that, and we're human beings, right? We, we won't achieve it all the time, but when we can, um, 
or if we have been sort of doing it, say, say you had a very successful day of, of being that, that person you wanted to be, and you then practice the Qigong, it'll be different. It'll feel stronger because we've harmonized with it. it, it it's, it's less to work against, I think. Friction, resistance. Yeah. Do, you, do you mind? Um, I know it's 9.30 your time almost. Um, if we could take a short little period here and have folks who would like to unmute themselves, not all at once, and ask a question or two. And sure. so please do this. Please have one question at a time and then let the next person go. All right, so, the lightning. Okay, I'm ready. All right, lightning round. So whoever speaks first gets the floor. I can't possibly <laughs> choose for you. Don't be shy. This is your one chance. I, I hear crickets. Okay. No crickets. I was curious on uh, Abdul. Sometimes when you have um, individuals who, um, for example, do really well in treatments and sometimes will surprise you. And then you have other ones that you don't really see much change. Have you found a commonality between those? Like sometimes I think it's the life force or energy that they also have. But um, I was just curious if you've noticed anything also. Sure. Uh, it's a great question. Um, to, to your point, um, let's say the person is well primed. You know, they, they generally have a, 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 an intact constitution. That sure helps. Um, another thing that helps, um, are they resisting what is trying to happen? Now, a lot of people, they may say, oh, yeah, well, I'm here. I showed up. Uh, I'm trying. Um, and yet, you know, I remember once this guy uh, coming to me and I said, so what brings you today? He said, you know, my wife made me come. <laughs> and, and I said, oh, well, so what does your wife think is wrong with you? You know, um, I'm sure that could have been an interesting list. <laughs> But he, he wasn't there because he wanted to be there. That can be one part. Uh, he didn't want his wife to be right. Um, so it was going to be a lot harder to, to help him. Um, other, other components. Um, is, is a person um, truly receptive to what you have to offer? It's not even that they are, oh, I'm 100% on board. I'm with you. As long as there's not a resistance between that. You know, it's okay to say, I don't understand this, but I'm willing to accept. Uh, and other things can be um, a person's surroundings. You know, if a person is living in a uh, disharmonious environment, and that could take lots of things, right? That could be um, anything from bad feng shui to a bad roommate, you know, <laughs> like that. That could be an issue. Uh, maybe, maybe the food that they're eating isn't the best for them. Um, they're not getting enough rest. They're not, but a big part of it is, are we able to approach life more calmly? And, and are we able to um, be okay with not being okay, if that makes sense? Um, you know, there are so many things in the world that are not to my liking. Um, if I focus on those things and I get myself really worked up about it, I burn up a lot of positive chi that way. So it's hard for that chi to, to take action. So a lot of it is, is our, our own internal state. Um, and believe it or not, that's the short answer. I was curious because I was um, exploring also the concept of like a linchpin. It's like sometimes you may have a pattern that may be underneath the larger pattern. So you see a temporary change, but then the larger pattern would reset. Truly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, for some people, they, they have been making progress for a very long time, you know, maybe not even knowing it. And for them, it's like, Oh, that session was miraculous. Maybe, but maybe they had been precipitating this miracle all along. Um, and then in, in some other people, maybe they hadn't, they're just getting started. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. You bet. I think Richard, I saw his hand go up there. Yeah, so Richard, let's unmute you and get you going here. You're unmuted, um, Richard. 
Yeah, you had mentioned, Keith, in terms of the work uh, with the people you have done in terms of your clients, that there's only really a handful of people that will do the work, uh, do the practice. Um, do you find the same thing, Paul, as far as the clients that you have of the idea of uh, on pangu.org where they talk of these people who had just, if I can use the term miraculous, though it could be two, three, four years before whatever condition or disease they had, they were able to overcome, I suspect, not only from the Pangu practice itself, but also what it brings, what cultivating the chi, as you mentioned, but more than the chi, which is what you're tempering, what you're able to, uh, you may not heal in a context of transform. And that was the, the kind of a part of the question in terms of the idea to me of healing was at, at some level, well, I don't have that anymore, as opposed to I'm able to redirect it or not embark onto what is uh where it'd be very easy to just you know slap at the mouth or uh, retorque as opposed to okay well what what do i want to do with this um so i'm not sure my question is and all that anymore <laughs> may i try <laughs> sure uh, i think to, to the beginning part of your question um do i find that very few people are willing to do it um, both yes and no, uh, meaning that, um, number one, I, I come from a long line of people who know how to nag. Um, we're, we're, we, it was almost like an Olympic event. In my <laughs> so I'm good at it. I'll just keep harping on it. Like, you know, if, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. So there is that. Um, and sometimes that's not the right approach, but sometimes I'm subtle and sometimes I'm not. Um, but but always there's that encouragement to say you know if, if you are able to give this to yourself and sometimes that means somebody will say well i don't like it it's boring it's you know it's so far i get it um but you know so you're gonna have to this is gonna hurt you know, we start with that and they say what do you mean by that well being sick hurts being being injured hurts and being bored hurts so let's pick the hurt that's going to give you something instead of the hurt that's going to keep you where you are because we're going to have to do your pain you can't avoid it so let's pick one let's pick a useful hurt the the other part and, and so some people are okay with that um at, at the same time um for the most part you, you know people don't stick around with me very long um if if they're not motivated to do something because mm. uh, i i I'm just, I'm a pain in the ass, you know, otherwise. <laughs> uh, you know, so if you don't mind having a pain in the ass, it usually works out. Mm. Yeah. So you're committed to their change in essence. You're committed to you in terms of your, your evolutionary process as well as wanting to share and hopefully um, not imprint, but I mean, you don't want to waste your time either. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that um, this gave me so much that I, I get that I probably at times sound like an evangelist in the most <laughs> noxious sense of the word, and I don't mean to be. Um, but it, there's this part, you know, when you can see the potential for good in front of you and, and to want that so badly on somebody else's behalf because... Mm. When I've been able to participate in that, I can't think of a better way to spend my time. Mm. Mm. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Yeah. All right. Surely you have one more person here who would like to throw a question. And a, a new person, a new practitioner, Erin, looks like she has a question. Erin <laughs> um. <laughs> and I go way back. So. Yeah, on this history. <laughs> Not as way back as you and Keith, but um, so um, I was thinking about um, like this, the idea of destiny and or um, like, oh gosh, that was a big, <laughs> I'm trying to keep it small and concise. So um, let's say somebody, you know, I forget who it was, this or was it Fonding, that somebody had this story, had had a destiny given to him, someone did a reading on him and he was a, he was a great master and and then he started practicing Panghu Shengong and he changed his destiny. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I do. So 
Can you talk a little bit about that, about what, in a concise way, what, what shall be in place? Like how possible is that for us normal? <laughs> I, I don't know that I would be qualified to answer it, but I'll, I'll say what I know philosophically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the I Ching, we'll go back to the I Ching. Um, it, it says uh, there are certain things in life that are, are predestined and are one's fate. And it's all through the book. You know, if you ever really want to um, feel a little pessimistic, pick up a copy of the I Ching sometime. You know, it's almost always telling you, oh, there's a warning here, there's a warning here. These are, these are your shortcomings. It's, it's not a real, like, it's not meant to be a book of encouragement. It's meant to be a book of, here's some advice, you know, like here's where you're weak, now get strong, right? And going through it so many times, there's this one message that continuously comes through. This is there's only one force that is more powerful than one's destiny, and that's virtue. And they say, if, if a person is able to cultivate enough virtue, then it is possible to overcome one's fate. Um, now, how that works, and in what way that works, I couldn't say. I do know that there have been many times that, that Master O has worked with people, and um, he is able to direct somebody in a way to cultivate their virtue in a way that they may overcome their fate. Um, now, it's my understanding that it, that it helps if that person is virtually, virtuously inclined to begin with. Um, and then I think he's able to offer that advice. Um, and, and if he's not able to help, it doesn't mean that the person is not deserving. It just may be that that avenue isn't open. But I, I do know that that's the only way that destiny can be reshaped. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it like it seems too like so if like if an avenue is not open and there's a certain way that life is going and it seems to be it there's um the, the amount of tempering or suffering that you experience would be uh based on how well how kind you are how calm and benevolent like that there's a direct relation there i'm just thinking like clients that have um congenital things or like they get a terminal diagnosis or something and how they go about that seems to be I mean if, I mean it's very obvious to say but I guess I'm thinking about helping people tap into that even yeah. I mean, practitioners who get diagnoses even I, I think to encourage people in what Master O refers to is those five virtues right he says yeah. calm tolerance humility, diligence, and perseverance. And, and of those five virtues, if, if, um, I've, I've thought about this a lot. Uh, usually when I'm up against something, you can, I, I can almost bet that I'm blowing it on one of those virtues. You know, there's something that, that I'm not, it's usually more than one, but, but there's usually one that really sticks out. Would you repeat those again one more time, Paul, for everybody, those virtues? I'll try. Calm, <laughs> tolerance, humility, diligence, and perseverance. And one more question. Would you mention an I Ching book that you might recommend for everybody to read? Since you've mentioned the I Ching a few times. Gosh, a good, a good uh, there aren't really many. So books. don't read any books on I Ching, please, no, no. everybody. It's really, really hard to, to find. What I, what I found that I had to do is read several if I were to pick a favorite, um, Thomas Cleary does a really nice job of interpreting it from a Taoist perspective. So I would probably, he's still my favorite um, out of all the, the interpretations. Um, I know Richard Wilhelms is probably the most common um, and is probably my least favorite, uh, although it has an excellent introduction by Carl Jung, um, but you can find that online. So I would say, like, download the introduction. And <laughs> All right. Anyone else want to throw a question out there before we let Paul go for the night? 
Come on, guys. After, if everyone uh, gets a chance first. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Appreciate that, Abdul. Anybody else want to throw a question out there? Oh, oh, Marina's scrambling. She's scrambling. And uh, you're now unmuted. Go right ahead. Well, my dog's here. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know if Paul could elaborate on how you help people who um, are stuck um you know emotionally or physically and share about what you know with and getting them past the thing that you have to believe to do it and are like they're just not even willing to to list hear you because they think you have to believe for it to work mm. so you know. good question good question okay so the first thing um you know, I, I have this tendency to, um, to to talk about things in, in a in more, uh, what should we say, practical terms, right? I usually say to somebody, have you ever been to a casino? And they'll say, yeah, I've been to a, 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 a casino. And I say, okay, you, typically if one is a sensible gambler, if you can even put those two words together, you walk into a casino with only as much money as you can lose, right? comfortably right and so i usually say to somebody okay so what if you were to gamble with me on this one and and so what do you think is a sensible amount of time that you would be willing to devote to this and don't worry about if you believe me you don't believe me just for this period of time even if you think this is the most ridiculous thing you've ever done right just for this time gamble with me and all you're going to lose is time and you know you've blown time on, on like a reality TV show, right? Or, or, you know, brooding about something. You know you've spent time poorly. We all have, right? So what if you were okay with spending it poorly in this way for a little while and see if you could be surprised? That's, that's usually my sales pitch. Um, and, and then at the end of it, what happened? And, and sometimes, you know, for some people, they're very, uh, like, they like systems, you know? I, I, I have this one guy who's, he's an engineer, right? So what I did was I, I was like, well, what are your problems? Rate them one to 10, you know, we created a whole graph. And he was just like, I'm a scientist. I don't believe in, in, in what you're doing. And I was like, that's, that's okay. I do what I do and I don't believe in your science. That's okay. Um, but so what? They both work. So let's, let's do this. Make your list. Rate it from 1 to 10. And now suspend your disbelief for three days. Try this for three days. Rate it for three days, but rate it honestly. And, and be okay if, if it's different from what you put in there. Something like that. Okay. Thanks. You bet. All right. If anybody else? And if not, Abdul has another question. I'm ready. This one's just more of a, a lighthearted ending question. But uh, Keith always tells a story of uh, him in acupuncture school. And uh, you coming in and doing the, uh, the acupuncture without actually touching a student. So I was yeah. curious what, um, when you first had that, uh, that um, experience, basically, of not having to deal with the physical anymore. OK. Um, that was a training, interestingly enough. So uh, the first training that I had, uh, this guy, Tom Tam, was my first teacher. And one of the great things about him is he is part mad scientist. <laughs> so he would look at, at all of these concepts, at the classical concepts, and say, are we sure these are real? Are we sure that everything that everybody's saying about these things? And he would try to test out each one. And there is, uh, particularly in a, a system of Taoism called Dragon's Gate Taoism, which says that everything is a hologram of everything else. And he s saw that as likening it to Carl Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. And so basically he's saying, okay, you know what, maybe we all share a universal mind. And he started just doing it. He just said, okay, let's, let's imagine that, um, it could be an object or it could be some, it could just be a space in front of you. And I'm gonna let this space in front of me represent 
this person's liver, let's say, or the, the point that's going to help this person's liver, right? And so he would move chi to that place and it would reflect back to everybody else because he was able to stay in a state, what he calls the qigong condition, which is really just sort of being relaxed, calm, and you can feel the chi flow in that moment, in that moment. And then out of that, you're able to sort of reflect chi much more easily. So after having it done to me a couple of hundred times, <laughs> being like, okay, you know, that's completely out of, out of my realm of acceptance, you know, for the first 50 or 60 times, you know, cause I, I want to point out, you know, I, I, I grew up in a Boston Irish neighborhood. This, you know, if, if it didn't involve alcohol, it probably wasn't worth considering. And, and so we were, he would do this a good 50 or 60 times. And after a while, I was like, oh my God, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I think that, that either, either he's crazy and I'm crazy too, or this is a real thing. And so then he was like, okay, now you do it. And I remember the, the first time that I, that I worked with that, you know, I, I did it with a friend. He was a, um, my, my oldest friend, actually, Richard. We, we, we were training together. We, we met when we were seven. And it was the craziest thing. You know, I would, do, I would do this. And he was like, I really feel that. I'm like, no shit. You know, and then he would do it back. And then there'd be all of this. And then we were like trying to find more people. Like, hey, let me try this thing uh, you know, to a point. And um, after you do it after a, a long enough time, it starts to feel like it's normal. Yeah, it's you your know? new reality on there. Yeah. Yeah, and it was really, I was, uh, and now today, you know, when, when, when I think of it, to me, it's like, oh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah. And of course, it, mo most of my work I do over a distance, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, if somebody calls and they may even be in another country and say, like, hey, can you help? Sure, we can move to you for you in that way because it's not limited in this way. And to me, it makes perfect sense. But every couple of weeks or so, I have to explain that to Mm -hmm. That's funny because you came into the school and, and you did this and, you, and later you're like, yeah, the, uh, the faculty's not exactly uh, <laughs> happy that I did that. <laughs> they didn't really like the fact that I, uh, you know, ruffled the feathers the way I did because it left all of yeah. us going, hang on a second. So this is our clinical year and we've learned all this um, theory and this guy walks in and puts needles into a doll and one of our classmates goes, Hey, I can feel that. And we're like, you can? What? <laughs> really? I mean, it, it, it blew our paradigm. And of course, the staff's like, great. How are we going to put this back? We can't get this genie back in the bottle now. They get all well, these questions. <laughs> well, acupuncture, all of Chinese medicine is developed out of, of Qigong. And, and, if you, and one of my favorite stories is, you know, when they try to teach us the history of Chinese medicine. And nobody actually knows, right? So... One of the explanations is we think acupuncture came from battle wounds. <laughs> so you try to imagine a guy with a spear sticking out of his chest saying, hey, get the plus side. My shoulder's a lot looser, you know, or, or my asthma's cleaning up, or, you know, that doesn't make sense because um, chi re behaves the same way that blood does. If there's a trauma, it will redirect it away at first so that you don't lose chi in the same way it doesn't want you to lose blood. Um, so there had to have been something else. Now there's energy cultivation. When a person reaches a sort of critical mass of that energy, it begins to amplify the, the senses we already have. So one begins to see in other spectrums. In this case, it's possible to see where the energy enters and leaves the body. Now we call them points, they call them gates. And then you can see how they link up to the organs and that sort of thing. And I think that acupuncture, you know, in terms of the theory, was written down for, for those of us who can't see that. Yeah. Good, good, good. Thank you very much. That was excellent. All right. It is almost 10 o'clock for Paul. Oh, wow. And so he's probably needs to go, go, uh, you know, I do other things <laughs> this evening. But I really appreciate Paul coming and doing this. And I, and I want to leave it with this. He's, his book comes out on the 28th. Is that correct? Of this month? Okay. Yes. So, the print version is on Monday. Yes. 
And, and I would recommend, and I can't imagine that you're all not going to go out and buy a copy of this after having an interview like this. I, I mean, I would question your sanity if you don't buy this book. So get this book and, and I'll tell you, there's so much, so much packed into this book. It's not an extremely long book, but every page, so much is packed into this book. You'll be reading it and rereading it and rereading it because there's just so much to take in. Uh, I've got a few people in real fast here, Paul, that are giving me some group chats. Um, where do you purchase this Kindle book? It's not on Amazon. Um, it is on Amazon, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then Kathy says, thank you and congrats on the book. Yeah, it... Um, Go go get the book, absolutely. And also, Paul, treatments. Like as he's been saying, he does treatments. He has a website, and I've been linking it to all my um, uh, advertising on Facebook, but I'm going to link it to this as well, as well as the link also to the, the, um, the Amazon link to his book. I'll put on this post as well after it gets um, uploaded onto Facebook. All right. Thank you, Paul, very, very much, as Good always. Work. It was nice to finally meet you. We heard so much about you. <laughs> oh. All, All right, right, folks. Thanks, Paul. That was awesome. Take care. All right. See you guys. Angel. Take Bye. care.